No my heart of mine, and welcome to the Exchange Cafe. We're a year on from the cyclone that devastated Gisborne, and we've had an enormous amount of interest from our community in solving the problems we face. Today we have two people on the couch who are incredibly focused on supporting that kaupapa, and uh, it's going to be an amazing opportunity to speak with them. Welcome everybody. Uh, let's first do a little round of introductions. Harley, obviously we recognise you. You're, um, you're here uh, with your Tuwu hat on today, is that right? right. Yeah, so I'm um, recently joined Tuwu, which is a small charitable trust looking at and supporting research into climate resilience in our region. Awesome. Um, and then we've got Anne and Christiane, and uh, you're, you're, you're here from Auckland University and you're right. involved in a <coughs> democracy project. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that, Anne? Uh, yes, we've been working through through our research program originally. Um, we've gotten into um, looking at different ways to use deliberative democracy approaches to improve our public decision making and get uh, people involved in in helping decide when they're through in, through being informed and listening to a lot of different perspectives. It's a new way of um, making better decisions that help everyone. Great, and you're delivering that through an organisation called? Called Koi 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 yeah. Koi yeah. So Koitu is uh, the Centre for Informed Futures at the University of Auckland. Um, it's fairly new, just a few years old now. And the origin story of it is that um, many of us had been involved in the inaugural office of the Chief Science Advisor of New Zealand, Sir Peter Gleckman. Um, prior to the current Chief Science Advisor. And one of the things that we uh, had become increasingly aware of in that office was that um, there were a lot of problems that were just really long-term kind of the wicked problems, right? That government is just, finds it really difficult to deal with for obvious reasons, you know? They're dealing with acute stuff, day-to-day -day stuff, increasingly acute stuff. Um, and there, we just felt that there was this need to be able to look at focus on some longer term, um, difficult, complex problems, and then also look at ways that we can approach them um, as communities, as uh, regions, and as a, as a country in new, in new ways that bring in both uh, evidence, which was what we were specializing in, that kind of evidence to public policy, um, but also bringing in public values um, more directly, right? And so that was that whole sort of question for us, like Anne said, it originated as a research project, but looking at ways that publics and experts and the expertise that resides in the public can come together um, and deliberate on issues when they learn more about them. Amazing. Um, I guess, Harley, we, you, had a, you had a fantastic symposium just a week and a half ago, something like that, two weeks ago, and um, and I think that really showed um, how broad the participation is in region for these types of challenges. Um, can you tell us? So you're in a facilitation role in this space, or how are you? Uh, how is Tawu um, bringing this deliberative democracy um, uh, cope up? With you? Um, so the the story starts before I. Um, became part of Te Wu, um, but uh, Council and Te Wu have, um, even before the cyclone, were talking about how there could be a, um, how they could work together to support more deliberative approaches to democracy with a focus on the big climate adaptation challenges that the region faces. So um, my role was to um, provide project oversight for this project, this deliberative democracy project. And it's been in two, two phases. Just, so just quickly, we've had a phase one, which was reaching out to uh, three communities in Tairawhiti to um, interview uh, community members. It was actually the interviewers were members of those communities uh, to better understand how they are coping with um, the recovery and how how they are also planning um, their planning for future resilience and for climate adaptation and so to basically better understand um, yeah how they're going what support they're getting what support they feel they need 
and um, what the what that sort of future uh, might look like in that climate adaptation space. So we have a phase one report that captures all of the, the interviews and the feedback, and the, just quickly the three um, regions that, oh sorry, uh, communities that we focused on, the Matakawa up the coast, Mudawai, and then the um, disabled community in the um, Gisborne city. So those were the three areas. Um, we have a report, that report was presented at the symposium you mentioned, um, it's great that Exchange Cafe has recorded that, <laughs> so we can we can share that presentation and the key findings in the discussion um, that happened at the symposium. Uh, and it was always a, it's always been a two two phase project, and the second phase was to um, explore and implement a deliberative approach for our region, um, with a real sort of focus on the idea of a citizens assembly. So we're kind of finishing phase one with that report and now um, we have our wonderful people from Poitou here to talk to, to us but also to talk to council um, later today about deliberative democracy approaches and um, how they might um, benefit decision making in, in our region. Let's steal the best of what's going to be discussed later on at council. <laughs> have it for ourselves. But I think the um, I think the uh, the most interesting part of this conversation to me, um, particularly when I saw your uh, notes for your presentation later on today, um, was around the concept of deliberative democracy and its place in our community. Because. Mm. And uh, shout out to Meredith Akwata Brown, uh, one of my ex councillors that I was uh, that I served with. She um, she continually uh, reminded us that we were part of a participatory democracy system, um, and she did a fantastic job of polling her community and, and working on their behalf. I personally work in a very different way. I relied more on the information that was provided and um, and making decisions based on as much of that as I could consume. Um, and I really like what you mentioned earlier around um, sitting with community groups and, and getting and gaining their understanding, because in my role, that would have been what um, real consultation could have looked like. Mm. Um, and, and so I'm really fascinated to hear how deliberative democracy is different to what we already have mm. and what it means for our community in terms of their opportunity to engage and participate. Yeah. I don't know who wants to answer it. Yeah. Get in. If you want to take I'll a say, go. I mean, typical mm. consultation, and we did contrast it, probably if you saw something from the um, materials that we prepared for council, why it's, how it's different and what that draws out usually. I mean, not in these in-depth conversations necessarily, but in typical surveys uh, in most communities and that, that um, governments and local from the from the whole range is will draw sort of top of mind ideas or or uh, perceptions that people have and and some of them are can be quite fixed if they're only communicating in a small group of like-minded people without the broader perspective and without the evidence of you know and what the trade-offs mean so that's where deliberative democracy is different because you purposefully bring all of those different perspectives into a room and including bringing in the evidence and, and there, the discussion is about um, what the reasons are for supporting a view and, and have it. So it's not a debate, we're not trying to win, like I'm right, you're wrong. What this, we start from people's values, what we value in a community and where, where you're coming from, what are your stories but uh, and why you might think a certain way about a, 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 a policy or an approach and um, allowing time. So, so the four elements that we talk about are being um, inclusive and representative uh, so that the, the group that's deliberating is, is, does represent all those elements of a community that need to be in the room. Uh, it is informed by um, expertise from outside, from within the community. Um, what is the evidence? What, is, what do these um, choices mean? And having time to, to actually 
think and learn and consider different options, consider trade-offs, and fourth, to try to work towards some consensus that people can live with, even if they're not. I think through the process, people can um, support a, a certain way forward when they've been through listening and know why these, these decisions are being made, even if it's not their favorite route. They can understand why we're doing, doing things a certain way. And I think that's what's different about it. Mm. I think in my experience on council, I had maybe one committee that operated in that manner. And it was a committee that was joint um, Tangata Benua representation and, um, and council representation. And the only reason that it worked, I think, in that manner was specifically because we were chosen to be representatives in that group. There was mm -hmm. only a very select number of council and very select number of, um, of tangata whenua representation. And there was terms of reference that guided the principles of our decisions. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we ended up um, having, when, when that uh, committee made its major decision, we had a clear split between what council put forward and what tangata whenua put forward. Mm -hmm. They were both... Um, they were both uh, principle-based decisions, and the only difference was that council, um, council laws couldn't put forward a decision that broke the terms of reference mm -hmm. um, in terms of the achievability of council. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And it was a really interesting scenario because we all, because both sides accepted that outcome. Mm -hmm. We both went, that's fine, you're meeting your terms of reference, and Tangan Spino went, we're meeting ours, which is from our... Mm -hmm. for, which is a different term of reference provided by our organisations. So we're meeting what our requirements are, you're meeting what your requirements are, now put it forward to council and mm -hmm. let them decide. And it was a, it was a very um, rewarding process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as opposed to my typical council back and forth, which was a debate where you're trying to mm -hmm. win, mm -hmm. not a debate where you're trying to find the best outcome. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's, and that's, that's a really interesting innovation you know it sounds like uh, in in Gisborne in in governance right of how, of how to do this and that's something that um, I think in taking deliberative approaches and localizing them bringing them to communities or regions where there's already ideas about how to innovate that's one of the most exciting things right because this is not like an off-the-shelf kind of you know it's written down in a book and this is how it's done and here's the recipe not at all you know to the extent there's a recipe, it's sort of these four principles that I think we can all sort of understand inherently, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and so where there's innovation already happening, like you've described, you know, map onto that, you know, use it, leverage it, and, 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 and see how um, a deliberative approach can then e open it up even further, right? Because that's part of the point too, is, you know, to, to, to not sort of, take over the role of any councillor in decision making, but to provide a new tool or a new way for councillors to get new insights that they wouldn't maybe normally get, even though they're working hard out there with their um, cons constituents in their communities trying to get as much information as possible for their own decision making around the council table. Well, here's another way to do it, you know, in a, in a form that, as Anne said, is really informed that allows people to interact with each other and understand each other's, you know, ideas and, and sometimes sides of an issue, right? Sometimes the reason why issues are so seemingly unsolvable and intractable is because somebody has a really sort of entrenched position on this side and somebody has an entrenched position on this side. And then you kind of get them in a room and start you know, injecting a bit of the, the evidence and the data and what's been done elsewhere and some new examples and, and, and let them talk and magic happens, right? You, you start to see how things can shift. And, 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 and like you said, it might not be like perfect 100% consensus, but it's something that everyone can kind of get behind. I was gonna say, um, I'm losing my train of thought here that, uh, about 
what people think other people think as well. Right. I mean, not only does council do that, this is what we think people think based on, you know, might be based on surveys or whatever, but also the different groups within those deliberating fora. And in the, in the beginning, they might have a, a very different perception or think that they have, the, these other people have an extreme view and we will not, we will not meet eye to eye. And, and that's where you work through and you can find what's common here. What do we all, you know, there are things that everyone will agree on and you work from there. Mm. So mm. It, is, it is pretty transformative. We've seen even in very short processes, with the public, like just having that opportunity to sit and, you know, you set the ground rules of how, like you were describing how this, this what, what's, what are we starting with? What's the, the basis? Yeah. What are the parameters of this discussion? And how are we going to speak to each other? Everybody has a voice here. Everybody's equal in this, in this um, conversation. We all are bringing our reasons and that's what we're putting forward in a respectful way, listening to all of it. Now consider that and, and, and how we might find what's common and work from there. Excellent. Um, so uh, obviously our community <coughs> has like untold challenges in the sense of uh, climate change and adaptation, our response to the um, to the cyclone and the potential for um, ongoing events to trigger similar outcomes. We're by no means out of the woods, mm. pun intended. Um, and it's a is this a tool that can be applied to such a large challenge? And if so, how do you define your communities of interest that participate in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that was our challenge yesterday, <laughs> wasn't yeah. it, Harley? Do you <laughs> want to... So, so we're, we're at the sort of early stages of, of thinking about application and making sure that it's, um, it's not seen as another um, kind of arduous layer on what is a lot of um, work that's happening in our region and in terms of recovery in particular. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's early scoping, the, and, and no decisions have been made, so I'm not trying to mm. <laughs> jump into anything here, but the, the discussions, these early discussions have sort of centred around um, yeah, local communities, but maybe um, kind of catchment based um, discussions that could then, um, you know, the learnings from a catchment can be applied to other 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 catchments and other so, communities. Yeah, while the, I mean, there's a lot of layers and a lot of ways you can do it. You can start very high level, um, but there's, as Harley says, there's already so much going on because of post-cyclone recovery. There's groups doing things that, that you know, we don't want to just come in and start as if nothing, as if we haven't been yeah. thinking about what the future is, you know, but you, you can do these and really like high level, what's our vision and mm. what are the, what are the, um, criteria for making decisions going forward if we want a certain future let's let's agree on what it is and we thought about that you know that, that you could do it very broadly about our decision making processes should speak to these particular goals that we agree on but we've we're kind of coming to we want I, I know and went from experience some other experiences that people really do want to solve their problem as, uh, as locally and not mm. have this that's so abstract and especially when you're in a situation um, like Tarafati is that people do want to and they're already working some groups are working to mm. try to solve problems so how do we help that mm -hmm. and and mm. and give a long-term lens on it and ensure that we've got all the perspectives and mm. information mm. that people need to really mm. make those those initiatives that are already happening really work mm. and, and the other sort of angle <clears throat> we've been discussing is there's, there's clearly a lot of focus on um, land use and flooding. Mm. <laughs> um, how do we use the, or how could we use the deliberative um, approach to also factor in some of those things that might not be, you know, smacking us in the face so much. Um, mm. A couple of months ago, there was sort of slow kind of increasing concern about drought and potential fires that sort of dissipated but you know what are the other climate adaptation issues and challenges that um, we might want to weave into this um, into this approach yeah so we, we're front footing it a bit more yeah and, and I mean yeah. and I think that's where um, 
the deliberative approach is informed, right? And so that we have an opportunity to bring in all sorts of expertise from the region, people who know the region well, who have been studying your landscapes, your weather, your, you know, um, but, but also people from more broadly from Aotearoa across the Motu and internationally, right? So an approach like this, uh, you curate that, you bring in that expertise, you have people become very well informed, um, everyday people, right? Become very well informed on the issues through a variety of expertise that's kind of like the, 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 the fundamental stuff that we think, okay, here's the question that you have wanted to answer as a group. So let's bring in some expertise to inform that, but also then you tell us what you think the gaps are. Who else would you like to hear from? Not necessarily who else, but what mm. kind of further information would you like? Mm. And mm. that could be everything from, we want to hear more about the economic mm. uh, implications, or we want to hear more about the sociocultural implications, or we want to hear a lot more from Mana Whenua about what they see as the parameters of the, the doable in this catchment, mm. you know? And it's, it's, it's all of those things. Um, and of course, it's guided locally and by Mana Whenua. I, um, so there's a few things in there that I found really interesting. One is that um, one comment uh, in particular around um, people want to solve their problems. And mm. I think that is, uh, that is true in part. But I think also those who are disenfranchised want their problems solved for them. Mm. Um, and it's a... It's a, a difficult scenario to think that those who have been through trauma are able to participate in this way and solve their own problems. Now, yeah. as we went on to say, there are individuals who can, can uh, meet that need, become as well informed as they need to, and, um, and, and become champions in that space. But how do you bring those who are disenfranchised on board? Yeah. We actually really try to do that in the, the selection process, which is, should be, it, we, we use a, we, we call it a civic lottery. So the people that are in the room, it's, everyone has an equal chance. And especially in a small area, it's not that hard to actually get invitations to most people. Um, and, uh, and people who, I mean, we do incentivize people to come into the conversations because we really do want those voices mm. that aren't heard and they, they think they have no voice. Mm. Um, so that's part in how we frame the question and what we're doing and um, we support people to come into the conversation by um, compensating their time and helping with childcare, whatever needs to happen mm. so that you can, we, because your voice is important, we want you here. So. We can't reach everyone, obviously, but um, it's a really important part. And we, we design our recruitment usually to, to really try to reach out to people who would. And, and most of the time, the, the processes we have, even if they aren't the, 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 those very disenfranchised mm. people, most people in these groups that we bring in are not ones who usually take part in consultations. Mm. And they're, I, think that's, yeah. I think that's almost... Um, um, de facto, they're not, part, they're not the usual suspects, mm, you know? Yeah. And, and so what happens is the way the process is designed is you do get sort of those more everyday people who might not normally, they, they might not even be voters, right? They might have all sorts of barriers, structural and otherwise, to even casting mm. a vote in a, in a normal election cycle, right? And they might not be people who would take part in the consultations that are not easy for them to either access it's online or are not easy for them to get to or if if you know perhaps their elected officials don't get out to them as often as mm. as could be and so those like Anne said are the people that we look for um, but in addition to that the ones who the, the 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 partners and the and the stakeholders in the process who do have a specific interest um, in the question at hand so the advocacy groups the community groups they would come in as, as that layer of expertise as well mm. that would help to inform that public that has been recruited. Mm. When we did the, um, we did a little bit of a road show with the um, phase one report back to the communities that contributed mm. to, the, to the report and both 
the initial interviews and the discussion at those um, roadshow presentations, there was common themes around trust and relationships. Mm -hmm. And the trust angle was, um, you know, everyone has, <laughs> relationships are built up over time. Um, people often don't forget if they felt like things, they didn't get what they were wanted in the past and it affects how they want to interact with key agencies, mm -hmm. be they local government, be they iwi, be they, I don't know, other agencies. Um, what I'm, I'm hoping with this process is that the, it's not seen as some, because it's a, it's a sort of a, um, a power shift in terms of um, the, the information provision. So mm. it's not like a council consultation where council comes out to the community, provides some information, gets the feedback, goes away, and um, mm. some, some may sort of never feel really connected to what happens, what happened next. Yep. Um, this is about, as, as we've said, information coming from um, lots of different sources so that that sort of trust element hopefully is um, is less of an issue, and I hopefully it's beneficial for for agencies like council as well because they they're up for this and they're they're, they're wanting to try different approaches mm. to to connect with their community. So I mean, yeah. I think that's fantastic. You're you're very political in all of that in terms of uh, <laughs> in, in terms of being very polite about um, about our how we all felt about mm. consultation and yeah. I'm and. I'll be honest, like, I've never met a single council staff member who doesn't care about doing better consultation. Mm, yeah. Um, they all, and, and, uh, and that goes for council laws as well. There was, never, there was never a time where we felt like we were engaged as we could be or yeah. that, um, like, the, the imbalance of power when you're the ones who hold all the information and you're the ones chairing the meeting mm. and you're the ones... Um, you know, you, you hold a room so much easier than any individual participant and, and you're by default the uh, only source of authority in the room mm -hmm. or the only source of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So this concept must rely on external um, uh, stewardship or external moderation, support. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned about a lot of external kind of... Uh, uh, people bringing in the knowledge, um, how do the participants know what they don't know? Like, what are the, it, it's a very, very difficult thing to ask questions about the abstract. Yeah. Mm. And, to, and to, to request people who might know what you think you need to know. Yeah. I think how, that builds over the, over the course of it, which is why when it's something really complex, and this is a big mm. issue, you can't do it really quickly. And we spread the the sessions over time. So there's learning and people are, in the beginning, they don't know what they don't know. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's part of the learning and, and we help facilitate that learning. Um, we're not telling them what they, you know, there are some things that we know they need to know mm -hmm. and we'll bring <laughs> yeah. that in first. Uh, and so that's a start, but we as that in, builds just to on, clarify, we, the designers of the process yeah. who are, it's co-designed yeah. locally, yeah. right? So it's not us coming from Auckland and saying that. But no, I but, yeah. yeah. So so just to clarify that <laughs> no, element. I, I think the I think the point you're making though is really um, is really important, is that first you define your goals and yeah. your aspirations mm -hmm. as a group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you and then you seek the sources of knowledge you need to, to begin the conversation. Yeah. And then you explore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that hopefully at some time at some point you can come back to a consensus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the right or the wrong answer, but the answer that the, the information you've provided makes you choose. Because yeah. at some point you've got to do something, right? Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. And I think the point, well, you both made the point of sort of this idea of a shift in, in power, right? Because mm -hmm. that knowledge is power. And, mm -hmm. and it must, and especially in recent times, post-cyclone and with the trauma of, of that and trying, to, you know, pulling the region up out of mm -hmm. that, um, there's a lot on councillors' shoulders. Um, and to go in and to have those expectations that you place on yourself as a councillor, but also that people place on you, I mean, that's huge. 
And so, you know, it's sounding like opportunities to broaden that out a little bit, to spread that kind of responsibility, but also spread the shared learning mm. is, um, you know, could be quite powerful here and it could be quite a useful way to, to go about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned a citizen ballot or, or, or yeah, a consultation process. Mm. Um, so going forward, obviously you, stage two, I assume, has a few different topics and some more specific around this. And how will you go to community with the consultation? So I guess first on the <laughs> stage two and second on the, the process of um, selection or the process mm. of, of, of consulting. Yeah, I don't have all the answers of, with stage two. I think there is some further conversations to be had with um, with the um, the funders and yep. with Tewu and with Koitu. But there, but we've talked about co-designing this, so we do need to explore how we're not. It's not just this little huddle of of <laughs> it's not us again. Yeah, yeah, we're. We're cognizant of the fact we need to get that right, mm. and um, it will be reaching out to um, communities to get a, get an understanding of whether they feel this will be or this approach could be beneficial for the challenges that they see in front of them. So, mm. so yeah, sorry, I don't have the the, the answer. No, not at all. I... That's that that is an answer in itself, right? Okay. So, so stage one was successful. Stage two is looking for um, uh, uh, some purposeful outcomes that yeah. you'll co-design with uh, in region and, and move forward from there. Mm -hmm. And then um, in terms of um, how that consultation may look when you go to the community, because obviously form will lead function. Um, so let us, uh, let us discuss in general how that might look and how our community might get specifically involved with this. Mm -hmm. um, you, you in mail you we do call their phones? Uh, you could it, it really varies on the context and the communities and what we were talking about yesterday is do we select a few different catchment areas that have they will all have their specific issues but there are general learnings that you'd be able to carry out um, on just uh, climate adaptation in the, in this region from those but be able to look at several different uh, areas probably three is the maximum that would be feasible in in a in a in an assembly sort of situation. So you would draw on the electoral roll or the um, postal addresses in those areas, and uh, so there's different ways to do it. You can do it by letter drop. You can mail them out. You can call. You can. I mean, we haven't done it by calling, um, but we've done it through email databases or or through mailing. Um, a, a wide range, about 12,000 mm -hmm. uh, invitations go out and people then express their interest. So the, the invitation has to be enticing enough that this sounds like something we want to do and get involved in. Like, you're winning the lottery. You've got a yeah. chance here. Because, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, mm. it's still that issue of the really disenfranchised might just throw yeah. it out. But, just, um, just a post on the council Facebook page, your opportunity to yell at us in person yeah, yeah, instead, yeah. Of, so there's instead some of, of the that. comment section. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's some of that, you know. We, we, uh, and I think that's where, uh, like, like a, a third party is helpful. Like we're mm. we're doing this, but it's your chance. And we've done this in Auckland with people who don't necessarily aren't enthused about Auckland transport, and we're coming because we we can yell at them directly. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that is one one way to go mm. about it. Um, so you get you send out thousands of invitations, and we're uh, we, we haven't decided what what the size of that assembly would be, but they can be you know, 40 to 50, 30 to 50 people. Sometimes we've done it with 100 people, which is a little hard to wrangle sometimes, but it's mm. possible. Um, so you're selecting, you will go from the group that has expressed interest in being part of it. And then we use an algorithm that, because based on the demographics of the areas that you're covering, you want to make sure you're including all of those important demographics. So if you're the 118 year old that turns up, you're likely to <laughs> you get it because the algorithm's yeah, yeah. gonna go, yep, that's, that's the, the one. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and right, and I mean, when, um, I'll just uh, 
Anne mentioned the example of Auckland. When, we, when I walked into that assembly in Auckland, I was so amazed to see the faces there, to see the ages, to see the ethnicities, to see the socioeconomic groups, to see, of course, um, Tangata Fenua, to see just this range. Because Auckland is, you know, very, it's metropolitan, it's cosmopolitan, it's diverse, right? And so you saw that in the room. This is mini Auckland right here. Mm. And that was very powerful. And so here is the opportunity to see sort of the mini Tarafari region, what it would look like. We already know mm. the demographic breakdown. And so there's an expectation of, of that to, to appear in sort of mini version um, as a representative group. Mm. Um, to work with, yeah. In this region, you hope you have more than one 18-year-old because it's quite a high percentage of young yeah, people Yeah, it may here, well so. be a full uh, Māori rangitahi uh, assembly in the yeah. end. <laughs> no, it, would, it would be wonderful to see them participating, that's for sure, because, yeah. um, let's face it, docu uh, uh, democracy hasn't always been successful at engaging the yeah. youth. Mm. And um, I, I know personally, like, I don't think I'd... I'd never voted before I left New Zealand at 21. Right. And then I came back in my, in my uh, mid-30s and became a councillor without ever having voted. Wow. Right? Like, That's a so, claim to fame. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, um, uh, I think finding that, finding that um, uh, method of participation. Sorry. Myself. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Finding that method of participation to get... You know, the likes of all of my students in the other room here actually engaged and involved yeah. is really important. And um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to this um, happening because uh, improving democracy is, is really important to not just me, but to, I think everybody. And um, yes, yeah, so I really appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. And thank you for the enthusiasm. This is such an innovative region thinking about these things, you know, mm. um, that we're really so excited to be working, working with you. Wonderful. All right. Well, I'll just sign off. And um, thank you for joining us on the Exchange Cafe today, uh, where together we have the solutions. And that's uh, far more appropriate today than any of our other conversations. Matewa.